Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. It's actually episode five of the Justin Bell Show, and already lots of people uh, posting some comments up. Thank you so much. Uh, it's actually a day of David Hobbs, and uh, I went on Wikipedia. Uh, David is standing just in the sidelines, but before he comes on, I'm just going to read you. He, you know, he was born just before the outbreak of World War II, and nothing to do with it, apparently, but uh that was where his illustrious life started and then went on for a very successful 30-year career in motorsport, actually competing almost at every level, sports cars, touring cars, Indy cars, IMSA, Can-Am, and Formula One. Uh, he was in the Indy 500 and obviously many times 24 hours a day turner. He made 20 starts at the Le Mans 24 hours. He had a pole position and a best position of third overall uh, at one of the world's largest races. Now, he was due to be in Formula One, uh, that didn't quite work out. He had a road accident. And then he went on uh, to huge success in the L&M 5000 Continental Championship in a McLaren uh, Chevrolet. He won eight, uh, five of the eight rounds that, that year. And then about 12, 12 years later, he won the 1983 Trans Am Series Championship as well. He's made NASCAR Winston Cup starts and actually led two laps at the 1976 Daytona 500. But, of course, you and I, well, maybe you more than I do, uh, know David as really the voice of motorsports here in the States. He covered from, he did NASCAR, started out there, then went into Formula One. And of course, that warm, fuzzy voice was a part of our Sunday entertainment for most of us for, it seemed like decades. But of course, that era is over um, for all sorts of reasons. So I'm going to bring David in right now. And David, you are now with me on the sh with me on the show. Uh, welcome. Hello, Justin, and the world of motorsports. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome to the Justin Bell Show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, well, you, it's been easy getting you on the show, though, Dave, hasn't it? That was really simple. Oh, it was so simple. It didn't take us all about 25 minutes. <laughs> pick, pick that, do that, do the other. Stick it up your ass. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, everybody, we actually had a little tech. I felt like I was in um, Bombay doing Indian tech support to one Mr. David Hobbs as I am trying to uh, tell him how to load the app for this program so he can join us today. And I've realized if you're if you're over the age of 15, you're kind of screwed, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, and if you're over the age of 70, you're really screwed. 78. Yeah, I'm not exactly a high-tech guru. Well, everyone's saying they miss you. Uh, lots of people have said they miss you. Um, what's it like? You're in, you're in Florida right now. Does, does it feel like a little retirement? Look at the sunshine behind me. It is wonderful. It doesn't feel like I'm in retirement yet because obviously, you know, we wouldn't have started uh, for another, you know, till the end of March. So at the moment, I'm kind of enjoying the time off like I would do anyway but i'm sure that when that first australian free rolls around in on march 25th i will miss it a lot i, I know i will um and uh, hopefully the fans will miss us uh me lee and steve and uh clamor incessantly for our return which will make no difference for anybody well you know <laughs> Yes, it is. It's one of the slightly humbling areas of our life, isn't it? You kind of think to yourself that that the world is going to stop without you, and then and then unfortunately it doesn't. But in terms of Formula One, for, no, for the, I don't know, I wouldn't say that it might. But for the U.S. market, I've got to say it really does. It has stopped because I think the whole thing's going to be. Do we even know how they're going to show it to the world, to American audiences? <laughs> The one, what I've heard so far, and uh, of course this is just hearsay, is that ESPN are going to cover it. They are going to have a generic English language feed. Now that generic feed just might be, uh, you know, people like Martin Brundle and Damon Hill, which of course obviously can't do much better than that for Formula One. No. But I'm not quite sure how they're going to integrate it into American, the American program. There won't be any pre-race show, there won't be any post-race show. I'm not sure what they're going to do in commercial. Now, I believe, again, that ESPN had paid little or no rights fees for these races. But in return, they have allowed Formula One the right to stream it live at the same time on another platform. 
could be Netflix, could be Amazon, could be whoever. Do we don't know? But NBC wouldn't go along with that. I don't blame them. I mean, you know, why would you want to spend a lot of money on rights fees and then have it have it on somewhere else at the same time? Uh, obviously, this is all a ploy to get more money into the Formula One owners' hands uh, in ultimately turning the whole thing into pay TV, which they are doing gradually in Europe. Um, uh, some countries are resisting. Germany has resisted it, so they're not going there. But France have done it. And, you know, Alan Prost was saying the other day, I saw that, um, you yeah, know, the TV audience used to be about three or four million in France, which is what it was in England on the BBC. Wow. Yeah. And on Sky, in spite of all the mo- mass of the money they spend, it's only about 650,000, which is about what we had over here. And uh, when you think of the money this guy is spending, that doesn't seem very good. Uh, anyway, uh, and, of course, the teams don't like it because they they lose a mass audience. So when you're trying to get, um, you know, when you're trying to get a 30 or $40 million sponsorship for a Formula One car, which only pays part of the bill, um, and they say, well, how many people watch it? And you say, well, it used to be $50 million, now it's five. Yes. Yeah. It's all changing. The world's changing. Oh, this is now Eric just said, I'll miss David and Matchett as well. What a great lineup of talent. I'll miss their insight. And a guy called Peter just said, Hobbs equals legend. Why don't they just listen to you, the professionals? In TV, we often wonder why the people that write the checks don't listen to us. It's the same in sports cars. Um, But listen, some people, this is a wonderful question someone's just said, because remember, you started off as a driver. John Jones says, Mr. Hobbs, where does it hurt most when you get out of bed? Other than everywhere. My left knee. And <laughs> it hurts everywhere. I always, I'm always so glad that there's no cameras in the bedroom when I do get out of bed because, you know, I shuffle off to the bathroom and uh, I think then, what happened to that young man that used to leap out of bed and bound across the room and, uh, you know, do 100 lengths in the pool and uh, everything looked fine? But I think, it, I think it, the same thing happened to him as it did to the young man that used to leap into bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> So yeah. a friend, lovely girl here, Laura, said, I've got a question for you. How was it to drive alongside Brian Redman? Um, what was that like? Well, I only actually drove with Brian. Uh, I really only drove with him twice. Once was at the Nürburgring in the GT40 in 1968 for John Wire, and we came six. Um, and the other time was in about 1983 or four. And we drove in the Lumberman's 500 at Mid Ohio for Roy Woods in a Lola G332 uh, Can Am car, you know, when they changed from the Formula 5000 yeah. to Can whatever that model was. And we won it. So my record with Brian is actually you pretty know, bloody good 100% finish and 50% win. So you can't beat that with a stick. <laughs> well, talking about, I'm not sure this is quite the same, but you've, someone, Thierry, has just said, I presume you're in France, Thierry. You drive at Le Mans with a lot of cars. What was your favourite? You drove the GT40, which kind of gives you a bit of a cult status anyway, doesn't it? What was that? I mean, you've got the Matra there and everything. I'm an the icon. GT40. You're an icon. You are an icon. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm, a bell is calling you an icon. But, well, I love the GT40. That was great at Le Mans. A uh, great car to drive, very comfortable, had no vices. It didn't push like mad. It had no nasty habits of switching from understeer to oversteer. Your box was a ZF, a lovely five-speed box, beautiful. Um, driving position was comfortable. You had fairly, pretty good vision, you know, which is important in those long races. Um, and the whole thing was really a delight to drive. It wasn't quite as quick as the 908 at the time, but on the other hand, it was quick enough to win the World Championship twice, 68 and 69. So it was a great car. Um, other great cars I drove was, uh, he asked about the Matra. Matra was not bad to drive but it was bloody noisy um and the other one that was nice was the 962 the 962 was a terrific car too i mean it just had no vices it just did everything you wanted it to do you know um gearbox is a bit slow because it was synchronized uh, but other than that, i mean it you know it was key to start it the thing would idle you know for 10 minutes you know i drove one the other day david at, at, at daytona uh, kevin Jeanette asked me on the friday yeah. Yeah. to drive the 1995 uh, winning Kramer open top one. And that was actually, that was, a, you, as I'm trying to get in it, the gap between the steering wheel and the dashboard was so small and you have the key there and everything. Um, before we bring on a, a, an old bloke that does know a lot about 962s, 
your colleague, former colleague, Will Buxton, just asked this. That was really cool. With the imminent release of Hobbs' The Wonder Years, or whatever he's called it, will we see my dear friend Dave in the historic Formula One cars this year? He's asking you so you can't wiggle out of it, and he can sort you out of seat. He may be able to sort me out of seat, and I shall be able to wiggle out of that just as easily. Now, I will not be driving <laughs> in Formula One. I don't think I fit in most Formula One cars, even old ones now. So uh, I was very lucky. I did 30 years of racing, and I never even broke a finger. And people like Brian Redman, who were more successful than me, had quite a few shunts, broke a lot of stuff, including his neck. Um, and so I felt I was particularly blessed and very, very fortunate not to get hurt. And I just think I'm not superstitious, but I am a believer in the law of averages. And I just think that if you just keep on going, you know, sooner or later you're going to get hurt. And getting hurt at 23 is very different to getting hurt at 73. So I just uh, really don't bother to partake. I don't blame you, but let's oh, bring in it's me dad. It's your dad. Hello, dad. Hello, son. How are you? What's happening? It's echoing here, but I can hear you. I can, can you hear me? I hear you twice, so it's good. Oh, that's just, tough. Just so uh -huh. you know, everybody, this is how they talk to each other if they were standing next to each other. Yeah. <laughs> we don't shout, you silly bugger. Don't shout. <laughs> Stuff he comes up with this young squirt. He's he's fifty this year, David. I mean, look at it. Fifty. Yeah. I mean, I remember when we used to come to your boys' weddings and twenty firsts. And here we are celebrating at least fifty with yours too. I'm sure. Jeez. Well, poor old Reg will be fifty-six in May. Wow. Really um, yeah. Well, I was actually I was actually just thinking about that when I was just making some notes uh, on everything. The literally the most formative, uh, in positive and negative ways, moments of my teenage years were on the were at your family parties at your part at the house. Yes. Uh, in um, what was the name of the town? Prize Hardwick. Prize Hardwick. Um, Big cottage. Yeah, and what was funny about it was I remember we were on the way up there. I think I was like, so I would have been 14 when, I'd have been, what, 17 when Greg was 50, was going to be 21. And yeah. we're heading up there, and Dad, as we're pulling in your driveway, my dad, dad turned around to me and Melanie, and he said, listen, they'll be behaving very badly. They'll all be behaving badly. Don't get caught up in it. He said, and, and don't drink too much. And Melanie and I looked at him like, that's not going to happen. So no, thanks. Talk no, no. <laughs> about the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, did, I guess I didn't know you terribly well then. <laughs> did, did, you, did, you guys, did you guys actually ever drive a car together? We oh, yeah. We did behave. Yeah, we actually, even our results weren't that bad. You remember, we, we won the class with Steve O'Rourke in the M1 BMW at we Silverstone did. in the World Championship, right? We won the yeah. class and came third overall. So it wasn't too shabby, was it, really? And then no, we did it, another did we, we drove something else somewhere, didn't we, David? Well, I drove very badly Le Mans with you in, uh, in the Mirage, you know, which uh, Harley Clumpson entered for us. And, um, but, uh, and anyway, the car broke in the end. But uh, It was breaking I, in the beginning, if you remember. Fun. I said it was breaking in the beginning. We could never get it to run properly. Well, the problem was that uh, it was an open car, and me being just a little bit taller than you, my head was up in the wind all the time, and it was, the buffeting was really bad. But, um, um, yeah, we, other than that, we never drove much together, did we? Because I was looking forward to a year with you in Steve O'Rourke's car. You jumped ship to drive for that awful Rothman's team. Yeah, that no, didn't, didn't work out then. No, hold on. No, that was a bad decision, obviously. But no, um, I, only, I, only, I only jumped out and missed um, the Le Mans, Le Mans when I drove Porsche, the 936. Then I came back with you. And I yeah. think we raced at Kailami or something. David, you and me. Because you were busy in America then. Yeah. But, but I continued the, the rest of the year with Steve. But you, uh, anyway. Oh, anyway, but I went from Rothmans at the end. Well, maybe between your book, Dad, and David's book, you'll both remember what actually happened. That's good. Because, I, well, Daddy, have you already ordered this? Have you got? We should bring it up because this, this is why it's on. Did you know about this? This is it, Hobbo. Oh, I did. Oh, I know. It's, it's bloody. It, it'll be fantastic. Shit, I haven't got mine. Anyway, um, uh, well, it, no one's bloody, got it. 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 Should be. It should be a great. It should be a great book. I hope you're getting a lot of money from. 
They seem a lot of hard work for very little back, David. I can yeah. tell you. Well, I'm not looking for this to be a moneymaker. Um, I don't know why I wrote it, really, but Mrs. H thought I should write a book, and um, it's, um, it is coming out on March the 10th or 11th at, at Amelia Island, and then it's going to be out, coming out at the RAC Club in England on right. uh, March 22nd. Oh, great. And, and I went on Amazon, and, David, you will be very, very proud that a bell has actually dropped some cash on a Hobbs, and oh. I, I have ordered, pre-ordered my copy. Well done, lad. Yeah. Oh. I was going to aim for a freebie, but I did, wasn't sure how that would go, so I ordered one. You, yeah. should, you, should know, you should know by now, Justin, that you don't ever give or put any money in the Hobbs kitty because you'll never get any dividend from it. Ah. So, David, the, the thing is, is that what it, I was just thinking about that Le Mans thing. Um, <laughs> do you think it was a bit mean that, that Dad didn't share any of the, the five victories with you? Because he could, because a decent English chap would have done. It would, definitely. But, but let, me, let me just say, Dave, before you go on, I would have traded one of my wins for his fourth place at Indy. I don't I think said, Oh, I told you that I would have done. I'd love to. Have, I'd love to have finished Indianapolis. Well, even started it would have been a help. That would have helped. Yeah. Would have been <laughs> well, I'm very kind of you to say that, no, I, uh But a win at Le Mans would have been because uh, when I was a kid, Le Mans really was my absolute favourite race. I, I mean, I liked Formula One, but Le Mans somewhere I had a lot of the people that drove at Le Mans. People like Roy Salvadori, Michael Pass, of course Phil Hill, who won it three times. Uh, to me, those were my heroes uh, when I was a kid. And really, Le Mans was the race I wanted to win. And it was very disappointing to do it 20 times and not win it. And win. So, um, uh, so that was a bit disappointing. But nevertheless, uh, I enjoyed most of my participations there. The worst one, actually, was, was the one that you missed um, with uh, O'Rourke, Steve O'Rourke, because it, it broke all my rules of long distance racing. If you're going to break down, break down in the first couple of hours so you can go and have dinner. None of this. Yes in all through the bloody night and all through the sodding morning. Then you get to about two o'clock in the afternoon and kablamo, you're out. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Not fun. No, uh, I, I, I remember that because I was very conscious that I wasn't driving it, but Steve offered to release me and I didn't ask him to release me. He said, what were you talking about to Valentine Schaefer at Monza? And I said, well, I was talking about how they would like me to drive at Le Mans. And I said, I was driving for Steve and at that point, Steve said, no, I'd release you. He said, I'll be flattered. He said, uh, for you to drive for the Porsche factory team. So I did. And it, obviously it was wonderful. But I must admit, to see these guys thrashing around in that M1 was, it was quite emotional, really, because they packed up. I thought you packed up much closer to the end than 2 o'clock. But it was bloody late on in the race, wasn't it? Well, and after all, after all that racing, to suddenly fall out that far, you know, after all that hard graft, I mean, Oh, it's just murderous. And then to see you park on the side of the road was sad. I see somebody just put up, not as bad as the Toyota, not last year, but the year before. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, been. God, that was that was crazy. That oh. wasn't crazy. Uh, Ali well, said that. Well, uh, so, so uh, I just want to, because uh, this is actually, I'm going to go back to David. I'm going to kick you off in a sec so I can talk to David a bit more. It's so it's the David show. Oh, nice. The Derek show. I, I, haven't um, said, I haven't said much yet. I wanted to yeah. say what I thought about him, really. I would like I would like you to say what you think about him at the as as no. enter into his retirement. The the, the 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 sad the saddest thing was in all reality is that he was born too soon, and uh, those three or four years between us made a difference between our, our racing careers really coming together because he was always that much ahead of me. We never did Formula 3 together. I don't think we did Formula 2. He was in Formula 1 before I got there. He was spat out, and I went in and was spat out. And, of course, you know, his Le Mans stuff came at a different time. But he, he did drive, obviously, for John Wire, which I think was a highlight of his sports car career, as it was of mine. And was, was John Wire's drive your first sports car? It can't have been at Le Mans in the GT40. Uh, I've driven other cars there. Um, my Le Mans history was a bit checkered because... I drove for Colonel Ronnie Hall there in 1966, and I thought, wow, what a fantastic, because Ronnie Hall ran the Ferrari concessionaires in Britain, and he had a good team. He had some great drivers driving for him, and he had a lot of wonderful wins, uh, you know, and I thought, 
Richard Atwood and David Piper were driving a Ferrari 312. And I drove a Dino with um, Michael, um, Michael, uh, Michael, gosh, anyway, Michael. And um, we, uh, and both the cars were out within about two hours, which was so unlike the Colonel's cars. I couldn't believe yeah. it. Um, so the GT40 certainly wasn't my first race there, but um, it was the best team I'd ever driven for up to that point. I mean, a real professional team, you know, people actually, you had people doing the tires, and you had people doing the engine, you had people doing the chassis, you had people looking after you, the drivers, had a proper motor home to go to. First time I'd ever had that sort of comfort. That was great. Enjoyed it. But of course, in fact, when you think about it, John Wire really set the bar for what racing should be for endurance racing. I mean, it's where you went early on. It's where I went certainly very early on. And ever after, I always rated John against John. Every team I ever went to was I rated it against Wire with all his technology and his, you know, dear old, what's his name out there, waving his wand and checking the ambient temperature. No other team did that. I mean, the details that they had, and John Horseman with all his facts and figures was astronomic. It was. It was a great team to start with, yeah. And, you know, his humor, you know, I mean, he was nicknamed Death Ray. But I mean, he was an amazing man. I, he was like working for a school, because I'd only really just arrived on the scene, you know, for a couple of years of F1. And there I was, invited to drive for John Wire. And I'll never forget walking through the factory one day. And he, he looked across at me, and I was wearing jeans and a pink shirt, I guess. And he looked across, he said, oh, good morning, Bell. Arrived to color again, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dad, listen, mo moving on quickly, I just want to say I've got a show on Thursday where I've got lots of very attractive people joining me. And sadly, you two aren't invited, but um, it's going to just be bail. for... Oh, OK. I'm going it's to a little... bail, right? Nice, Dad. Sorry. It's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, um, but I figured that I should do a sh an episode of this show based about the uh, banning of grid girls in Formula One, um, just because I've, I've followed the story with bated breath um it's kind of the end of a bit of a sad era really isn't it what do you think of that dad what do you think of that david well Taking as far the... as i well david's much, have a much better you know thing i link on it because he's done f1 for years it, as far as in every respect from my point of view they won't ban them they won't stop it everywhere i think it's you know with what's going on in the world i guess we have to toe the line formula one being the the shop window as it were but i don't think it's necessary as i think i saw you put in somewhere these girls only do it only actually are grid girls one race a year it's not like it's their job they come on for the hell of it the fun of it and they're from the local school or the local whatever and they're just really colorful they love it i don't think they get abused in any way or anybody being rude i've never heard anybody being rude because we're far too busy thinking about with finishing the race than worrying about who we might play around with over dinner after the race so you know it's just part of the show and like. you know we just we just look at them at the start and it's pretty picture and it's the color. And I think we need it. There's so many men out there that we need some color. Anyway, that's my opinion. I, I think it's just, uh, it's an overreaction to some of these sexual harassment things that are going on. The grid girls are really very passive. As you say, this is not a full-time job. These girls may be models that mostly not. They only get one race a year to do that. Um, so it's certainly not a great job loss for them. And I, I do think it's uh, carrying things to extreme. And yet at the same time, in college and professional football, you have scantily dressed women doing cheerleaders. crazy dancing cheerleaders. Now that is exploitation of the of their of the of the woman's body. I don't think I don't think grid girls are exploited at all. So it just seems to me to be Formula One's gonna have a uh, looks like it's got a lot of problems. One of which, of course, is Bernard Charles Eccleston, who I see tweets practically every day saying how Liberty Media are doing everything wrong and they've got a oh, wrong, wrong, wrong idea. And apart from that, they've got to try and make the racing more interesting. They've got to get, get it cheaper. They've got to get more money in, which is going to be difficult if they keep taking TV audiences away by putting on paid TV. But they've got a lot of problems, and I would have thought that Grid Girls was the least of their problems. <laughs> least of them. Well, listen, Dad, someone just said they saw you... Um... Andre Needit said, is it possible we just saw Derek driving westbound on Alligator Alley? Ah. I think the answer is the answer is yes, Andre. He's at the dealership right now. Dad, so many people have got comments for you. We're going to have to get you on the show on your own. We'll do it from your office. Lots of pictures and trophies. 
Yeah, no, sorry. You don't, don't, I mean, you've had Hobbs after that. What? There's nothing can follow him, can it? Well, no, I'm closing the show down after this. <laughs> um, well, Jack, it's been wonderful to see you. <laughs> it's a surprise. You, David. I knew what, I what, what's, gr what's great about it, David, is that you can't interrupt me and I can't interrupt you because we get cut off right. See these mouths go. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and just so everybody knows, so everybody knows, this this should have been called Reginald meets Weishart. <laughs> Reginald. Yeah, that, that would have fooled a lot of people. You wouldn't yeah, have got Reginald. anybody watching. <laughs> anyway, it's lovely to chat with you and have enjoy, lovely to chat, David. I'll see you soon. Bye. See you again. Bye, -bye David. Bye. 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 Thank you. Oh, that was so. Do you know, Dad? Dad had to rely on. A twenty-two-year-old guy at the dealership to sort out that camera. Then, so so I'm I, glad he joined us. You have to get me sorted out. Oh, I know, I know. Hey, listen, just go, obviously, do, do you think you guys were? We're talking about the old days. Do you think you were luckier than the kids now racing? Well, uh, I'm not talking about luck is in fortune. I'm mean, as in, was uh, it a more enjoyable career? I think it was a lot more enjoyable because you enjoyed each other's company. You enjoyed the racing. That's all. That's all why, why we race like going fast and i assume that's why most kids start today but i have a horrible feeling that um racing i mean always racing was always a bit of an elite sport but now it's become crazy elite uh, because of the money and um i think that a lot of parents rich parents look at people like lewis hamilton making you know 25 million 50 million dollars a year and they think, oh boy, you know, this is worth spending a couple of million on the kid because if he makes it, um, you know, he could make 20 million. And yeah. uh, you know, to get, to get into Formula One, whichever way you look at it, is going to cost about seven or eight million dollars to get in. And IndyCar is not that far behind. IndyCar is probably three. You're not going to get into IndyCar without spending at least three or four million dollars. Ask Spencer Piggott's now. And, um, and of course, you've got the great examples of Alexander Sorokin, who's going to drive, you know, the Williams this year, paying, what, 30 million? Uh, last, last year, his teammate, Lance Stroll, uh, cost him, it cost his dad about 60 million, one way and another. So, uh, and of course, even Lewis Hamilton, who to me, is one of the finest drivers out there at the moment, for sure, and probably one of the best for a long time. And he was very successful, but he was, and his dad spent all the money he could possibly muster to, to get a, um, to get Lewis into into go kart. And they were very fortunate to win the right championship. And the the guy that presented the prizes was Ron Dennis from McLaren, and and Lewis said. You know, and that balls you where his hey, Mr. You know, Dennis, one of these days I'm going to drive a McLaren. I'm going to win the World Championship in the McLaren. And Ron, like that, kept his eye on him for another few months and then paid the bankroll. And to get Lewis onto the grid in Melbourne cost Ron Dennis or his sponsors and, you know, yeah. McLaren International, cost them probably $4 million at least because he paid his way in Formula 3, you know, GP2, everything into formula one so it but it ends out on that one being a decent investment obviously when you do that but these other kids aren't going to have a chance and it's awful when they come up isn't it and say oh yeah. mr bell what's your advice for me and i'm like well is your dad rich do you know yeah. anyone rich or are you are you raikkonen fast are you hamilton fast but even if you are do you just go back to the first bit is your dad rich yeah. <laughs> you know because if you're amazingly quick and somebody says, hey, we want you to drive our works, whatever, Van Diemen or something, you know, we want you yeah. to drive the factory car. And you say, oh, great, great, great. In my day when they said that, they said, we're, we're, and we're going to give you 10,000 quid a year or 5,000 pounds a year or 500 pounds a year, and you slip your arm off. Now, when they say we want you to drive the factory car, the next question is, how much money can you bring? And rather kind of knocks the, you know, the ground from under your feet. And of course, Andrew, your grandson, I, I've seen him at the races. I, I mean, I saw him last year at Road America too. But that's a good example of a kid that's obviously got the talent to a certain level. You never know until you get further up how good anyone is. But Andrew had the desire, the wish. He obviously has the contacts, but not the spondooly. What happened? You know, 
it's a classic example, isn't it? This year he was offered a drive in a in a in a Continental Challenge race. And the Continental Challenge is not exactly the top of the racing tree. I mean it's very definitely kind of first run. Very competitive. But right. and to drive one of those cars for an hour in a two hour race was gonna cost him forty five thousand dollars. Um it's 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 impossible. Um though so I I don't know. Um, next? Where it's going to all end up, but I mean the fact is we've got a lot of rich kids out there, and a lot of those fathers now look at it as an investment. When uh, uh, you know people like it who do other sports like athletics or gymnastics, those girls you know that won so many gold medals in the last Summer Olympics, those guys they put in just a massive amount of work, and their parents sacrifice. It doesn't cost them much money, but it, it costs them some. Uh, in some cases, it costs them probably all they've got. But the girls themselves or the boys, whatever you're trying to do, you, you spend hours and hours and hours and hours of practice and, and training. And then, in the end, you know, you just may not be good enough. And the yeah. same with racing. You, and in racing, of course, you, you've got to spend you got to spend a couple of million dollars, at which point you might finally say, well, I guess I'm not quick enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. and, and then the parents have to look at each other. Anyway, it's a bit depressing, really, because I think the, the market's changed. Everyone's changed. But just quickly, it was uh, someone um, – I'm trying to find the email, uh, the message. But uh, Alonso at Daytona, did he follow that? It was it, For me, it was amazing being there. I jumped over the wall and got an interview, and he was surprisingly nice and open. I think Indy last year gave him the heads up that when you're in America, you have to be fully accessible to everybody. Um, obviously, United Order Sports, they didn't – it wasn't a great race for them, um, but it was amazing for us to see another $50 million guy driving around a racetrack at Daytona. Does it bring back like memories of the old days? Do you think it's a great thing that they're able to do it? I mean, Formula One drivers in sports cars, that's, you wouldn't have thought that five years ago. No, and I mean, obviously, Nico Hulkenberg winning Le Mans, what, three years ago, was yeah. terrific, got in the arm. I think it's nice to see these guys... Uh, de-specialized. That's the trouble with racing. It's become so specialized. You only do Formula One or you do sports cars or really you do Formula One, you do IndyCar or you do NASCAR uh, or you do sports cars. And obviously a lot of the drivers who fail in Formula One, who just don't quite get it, uh, go back to sports cars. And so you've got a lot of really, really good drivers in sports car racing. It's the only place at the moment, it seems to me, where there's any money to be made, you know. Yeah. But I'm very disappointed that Porsche have pulled away from it, you know, an Audi. So there's a couple of real big holes there. Obviously, you've got Toyota, and that would have been a great spot for some young kid. And, of course, now Alonso is going to drive that car. So, so that's taken away the spot for, for some other young lad. And it's going to be – and I, you know, I think it may open the eyes of a lot of Formula 1 drivers that there are other things in this world besides Formula 1. Uh, and if they can fit them in – um, boy, I mean, I, I think it's great. I mean, people like Phil Hill and Dan Gurney. Dan Gurney won Le Mans one week and won the Belgian Grand Prix the next in his, in his own car. I mean, what a, what a couple of weeks that was. And Phil Hill did the same thing with the Ferrari. He won, he won Le Mans one week and won the Belgian Grand Prix the next, in, in, both in factory Ferraris. Um, and so I think um, I think it'd be, see some change. I, I like to see it. I really you know, and that's why what's good that? this uh, – Young lad Alex has just asked, what do you think of the way how Zach Brown's running McLaren? Well, I think that's a sign of it, is him allowing Alonso to do it. I mean, he was there. He was there in the pit lane. We had a good chat just before the start of the race. Um, the guard's changing, isn't it? The guard is changing very much. And Zach Brown, of course, is going to bring a completely different look to McLaren, I'm absolutely sure. Um, and he has had the nous to realise that if Alonso wants to do Toyota to drive in the WEC, um, it's in his interest, his, Zach Brown's interest, to keep him on board in the McLaren um, and with the Renault engine, you know, who knows, they, they, they've got to be more successful than they were last year with the Honda engine, even though it hurts me as a Honda dealer terribly to say that. By the way, uh, don't forget to uh, call 6100 North Green Bay Avenue, Glendale, Wisconsin, where uh, there are all sorts of deals going on Hondas at the moment. Uh, but that's beside the point, obviously. Just a shameless plug, shameless plug. I was going to let you do it anyway. Uh, oh, this, this is a good question, David. Someone just said from Julius, what a great question. If you had to put together your 24 hour team, what drivers would you pick from any era? I like that question. 
Well, I think that um, we won't assume it's the old era where only two drivers drove. No, uh, four drivers, let's say. Say it's three, we'd have Derek Bell, uh, we'd have Derek Bell, we'd have Phil Hill, and we'd have Dan Gurney. We wow. might have a seat shift because Dan was so tall, but uh, I think that'd be a pretty good trip. Really that'd good. be really lovely. Well, David, listen, I just yeah, want to yeah, just say, obviously, that very excited about the book. I really am. Everyone, go on Amazon and, and have a look. Um, are you going to come to, will we see you at Road America this summer for um, the IMSA race? I shall be there for the IMSA race. I shall be there for the IndyCar race in June, and I shall be there for the Brian Redman race in July, as they say down here. And everyone tells me that is huge. I haven't been to it. Oh, my God, it's fantastic. Big crowd. I'll probably get 20,000 or 30,000 people there and 400 cars, you know, entries. No, I think it's, um, I think it's a great event. And that's in midweek, the middle week of July. Well, thank you very much, David. That was really nice. And I literally do my, my most, the, the highest and some of the, I think I actually threw up in your rose garden. I do remember that. I remember at three in the morning finding myself in your rose garden in England after the 21st birthday party. And I remember thinking, these are evil people. This is not. <laughs> well, you and your sister, Melanie, had a good time, I remember, at uh, all of the parties. And we enjoyed having you there. And, of course, your dad spoke so nicely at Greg's. Actually, it was Greg's. Yeah, it was his 21st. And uh, all of that is so long ago and so far away. And yet they're great, great memories. And uh, and it was it was great to see you in Melanie, grow up and look at you now, all grown up and got your own TV show and headset, looking all. Well, I, yeah. Well, I do want to say, David, that actually you are. I know this is kind of uh, to close with this, but uh, definitely for me in my broadcast career, you are very much a, uh, a yeah a figurehead for me of how I should conduct myself to try and be a better broadcaster. Quite so, right. That's what we're <laughs> going to leave it with. That. See you okay. soon, David. Take right. care. Thanks, Justin and uh, Derek. Good to see you all, and thank you all for watching. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Catch up on Thursday. Let's talk grid girls. Tune in then. Bye.